Go for it. Sweet. Uh, so my name is Ian McFarland. Uh, my supervisor is Daywon Jones, sitting right there. Um, and we've been working in John Bowers' lab, um, working to, I've been doing LAV characterization of epitaxially grown um, indie marshnite quantum dot lasers uh, grown on silicon substrates. Um, kind of a mouthful, but first let me kind of bring in uh, what something like this is used for. So how many of you have looked at a computer kind of uh, specifications label in the past few years and seen the label like dual core, quad core for the processor? Yeah, several of you. Um, so that basically means on a CPU chip, so this is kind of a rough diagram, they put multiple brains on the chip and so it's on a chip you have um, actual individual kind of processing cores and if you think about it, it's kind of fairly intuitive, but if you work with multiple people, like four brains or two brains is better than one, so um, you'd think the same works for computers, and it is true. Um, the issue, though, is because when you introduce multiple cores to a computer, um, there's a slowdown in between those cores, and part of this is just working together. If you think about it, um, if you were working in a group project, when you're working by yourself, you can just kind of think through a problem, but when you're working in a group, then you have to kind of slow down, format your thoughts, actually explain it to other people, so make sure you're on the same page. Same thing for these computers. The issue also is that with electrical components between the cores, um, this slows down connection speed, and then you have this kind of slowest point of operation, which um, kind of maximizes how fast your core can operate. We're looking to replace these components with optical components because um, then we can increase the speed of the core as a whole. Um, we've known for a long time that optical components can be better than um, kind of electricity and copper based things. And this is um, the fiber length, for example, doesn't matter as much for these applications, but um, we, we would like to be able to apply um, photonics kind of. Um, principles and the advantages of it on a small scale inside a computer as well as kind of already the application on the big scale. Um, so my group is specifically focusing on growing these uh, quantum dot lasers on silicon, mostly because silicon substrates are cheap. Um, if you look here, um, this is a diagram given to me by um, Daywon. Um, other 3.5 substrates can cost like 25 times the cost of a silicon substrate just per area, and silicon um, wafers actually come in much larger sizes, so um, there's kind of advantages to building on that. Um, the problem with growing on silicon, though, is that when you're trying to epitaxially grow on it, um, you have a lattice mismatch, and so with the silicon substrate layer, um, as soon as you try and grow some kind of um, 3 5 material on top of it, you have this diso you have dislocations that show up. Um, and these dislocations can kind of thread up through the uh, material, and then um, they can compromise your active region in the laser. And then when you have um, your electrons kind of moving around to stimulate emission, which is what you want in the laser, if they instead fall into these dislocations, then suddenly they're doing this as opposed to working as a laser, which you can imagine is non optimal. Um, so then, part of the approach to these, um, to kind of nullifying these dislocations has been to use quantum dot technology. So, modern commercial lasers are all based off of a technology called quantum wells. And so, on inside a diode laser, you have a, a basically planar region called an active region, and that's where um, your, you have your stimulated recombination, which then um, kind of, it, causes the gain region for lasers and you have um, coherent emission. The issue with that is because in a quantum well, so if you imagine this is a plane here, so this is where the electrons um, recombine and what you pump light through in order to um, get a coherent beam, they're free to move inside this plane and so if you have dislocations going through it, um, their freedom of movement works against you because they can um, easily kind of run into the dislocations and escape as leakage current or um, be um, expressed as heat, which is also not good. Um, so instead we're using quantum dots, um, which is, as opposed to just a kind of planar confinement, it's a complete confi confinement. Um, so when the electrons enter the quantum dot, um, 
they, that's, they're kind of stuck there. And so while the um, dislocations are still um, kind of affecting the material, if you use a lot of quantum dots, you might only have a, say you have a density of 100 quantum dots per dislocation, you might have one quantum dot affected, but um, you still have 99 more that work just fine. Um, and so this is an image of actually carrier-mounted versions of the lasers I've been characterizing this summer. Um, and uh, you'll see here, it's the, these are Fabri-Pro Ridge lasers. Um, and in the middle here is the actual laser cavity, and then um, there's a P contact and an N contact. What I've been doing um, is LIV characterization of these lasers. So I probe the lasers, um, run um, kind of steps of currents through them, measure their um, optical power and, and the voltage as well um, to extrapolate things like the threshold current um, and the wall plug efficiency of the laser. Um, and I'll go into both of those in a sec, um, but just for some perspective, uh, these lasers here, the width of this chip as a whole um, is probably about um, like one eighth of the width of your finger. So they're pretty small. Um, so then, here's LIV. So LIV stands for light current voltage, um, and it's a battery of tests um, that kind of show you um, multiple features of the laser, which I talked about before. Um, this is kind of the power as a function of current curve that you can see as it, see um, as part of it. And um, the two features we really care about in something like this is the threshold current down here. So if you'll notice, at really low current injections, there's actually no lasing. Um, but then it kind of jumps up. And so the point where it starts operating as a laser is really important. Because if you think about putting this in computers, they don't have access to super large currents. So you want your laser to actually work at the proper um, current injections. Also, we're looking at max power. Um, because if you think about it, um, if we can increase the power emitted by the laser for the same currents, then um, it's just a more efficient laser. Um, I've also been doing um, temperature characterization for these lasers. So um, they work at room temperature, but um, testing kind of how the um, threshold and max power degrades over um, increased temperatures. Um, the highest we've gotten so far for the Fabry Pro lasers has been 80. To drive it a little farther. Um, so the two big results from uh, my research this summer have been um, specifically characterizing um, really low thresholds in the lasers, um, as well as high wall plug efficiency. So the thresholds are really important because if you think about in a computer application, you only have access to limited power, but um, beyond that, the thresholds actually deteriorate as you go. So um, a threshold of three milliamps after um, continued usage could eventually turn into a threshold of five or six or 10 or 20. Um, and so if you're putting this in a computer, that basically determines the lifetime of the component. And so um, there's a real kind of reason for wanting to have as low thresholds as possible. On top of that, wall plug efficiency, which is a term I've been throwing around for a while, um, simply means the efficiency of conversion between electrical power um, that you put into it and the optical power you then measure. Um, and we've actually seen a highest wall plug efficiency of uh, 38%, um, but uh, we're looking to kind of drive that higher as well. Um, so, uh, Last thing that's also um, pretty important is um, we're looking to kind of, um, this LIV testing has been in preparation for lifetime testing at Intel. So what we do um, is we initially take these threshold currents and um, uh, laser characteristics before we have them aged. And then what we do is we package them up, carry them out them, and wire bonding. So that's um, what this is. You'll see these chips. The lasers are on a chip, and they're mounted on a big carrier, and then wire bonded so that Intel can automatically test them. Um, they age it at 35C and constant current injection. Um, that They actually inject current at double the threshold. And then what they do um, is they test how long the laser lasts. And our goal is 